welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Good afternoon, good evening, good day, everybody. This is Joel Simmons uh, with the Earthworks Podcast once again. Uh, I am very excited today to have uh, I guess I can say an old friend, <laughs> not that he's okay. really old, he doesn't look Fair. old, uh, but, uh, but an old friend of ours uh, and, and uh, a gentleman that we actually uh, call our chemist. Uh, Lawrence Mayhew has been um, uh, working with Jerry Brunetti and me for a very long time, and uh, we lean on you an awful lot for uh, stuff that we don't understand, chemistry. But um, I want to introduce you to Lawrence Mayhew. And uh, Lawrence, welcome. And uh, thank you. I, I think the first thing to do is tell us who the heck you are and, and give me some background. You've got such an incredible background. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm most amazed with is that you started your career as a glass blower. Is that that's true? Well, a uh, cold glass worker in the trade, as they call it. There's hot glass and cold glass. If you're a glass artist, you understand those terms. I worked, uh, started out in stained glass. And uh, around 1975, I lost all my money. <laughs> so, <laughs> Great. <laughs> trusting a guy who made a lot of promises. <laughs> uh, last time I saw him, they were both driving Cadillacs down yeah. Mannheim Avenue in Chicago, waving by. <laughs> so, With your dollars in their hands. Yeah, and uh, I, I was formally trained in uh, organic chemistry, analytical chemistry, biology, and uh, standing there on that street corner wondering what the heck to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, I, moved to Wisconsin. I moved to the woods in Wisconsin, and that's how I became an artist. So, short story. You made, you made stained glass uh, professionally for a while, right? Yeah, um, for uh, well over 20 years. Wow. Uh, ended up in the upper one percentile of artists income you know you look at artist incomes and i was in the 99 percentile depending on how you look at percentiles doing on top glass. on top you know on really doing very very well yeah but uh with a bad relationship with my partner woman and <laughs> all right let's and, not get into uh, that <laughs> trying to wake up in the morning and go back to work i i just burned out as an artist and I moved into a, a, an old farmhouse nearby, a few miles away. And I was just sitting there one day in this old farmhouse watching the snowflakes coming down. It was a beautiful winter morning. And there was a woman living upstairs in this old farmhouse. And I hadn't even met her yet. And uh, I, hear, I hear a phone ring, dingling, dingling. And I hear the footsteps coming down the stairs. Tum, 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 tum. <laughs> and she says to me, there's a guy on the telephone. He wants to talk to you. And I says, really? Who knows I'm even here? Yeah, well, his I'm name hiding is, out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my <laughs> life. <you know? laughs> it's an IRS, right? Not particularly interested in doing anything at that point. <laughs> well, his name is Gary Zimmer. Ah. Uh, I know you guys are in the turf world, but in the sustainable agricultural world, he's one of the top he's people. One of the he's, big boys, yeah. Yeah, he, he, uh, very well. he pretty well set the standards on what do you mean by soil balancing <laughs> right. and sustainable agriculture and all that sort of thing. But he was a very good friend of mine. I have known him for years. And I thought, what does Gary want? So I went upstairs into this woman's apartment who I married two years later. <laughs> <laughs> <How convenient. laughs> I'm, I'm up there going mm, she's kind of nice <laughs> <laughs> there you go so Gary said I've got something you might be interested in now that was the year 2000 uh, and uh, he said he said I've got something you might be interested in now I knew absolutely nothing about agriculture I, I had my own garden and when I was when I was in college I was shocked at discovering, I knew the chemistry of these chemicals that were in our foods and I was shocked at, at why would you put a toxin, why would you put a toison, poison, why would you put a, a fungicide in your food? And my dad and I figured this out back in the middle 60s and we said, we're not gonna eat any of that stuff. <laughs> and that was long before organic. 
Yeah. And Gary, so Gary knew my passion. That's where I'm going with this. He understood my passion. How did you know Gary? He was a neighbor. Oh, okay. So that's small world then. Um, I, hmm, long story. <laughs> and he <laughs> I got to know him. He knew you had a chemistry degree. Yes. Yeah. yeah we, we knew each other quite well. And gotcha. we both, we both built houses in the same area at about the yeah. same time. And, and, uh, we were very good friends. And, uh, yeah, after I met Carol in the farmhouse, Gary was best man at my wedding. So oh, that's okay. our relationship. There you go. Very, very close relationship. And I knew he was in this agricultural world that was totally different. And he told me, well, we primarily, now back in the 80s, he told me we sell compost. You know, that's how they started. What and, year was uh, this? What year was this phone call, roughly? 2000. Oh, okay. So it was that recent. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, it was 2000. It's only 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah that reason. That reason. <laughs> you just and like me, yesterday. that's just yesterday. Just like yesterday, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yesterday. <laughs> yes, and I'm 25 years old. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, he knew my passion for getting rid of or totally avoiding pesticides, herbicides, anything that kills and uh, what I didn't understand as a chemist is why it was in our food system. And Gary understood that. And he said, uh, I'm going to offer you this position called product developer. He said, essentially what it is, is you have to do research and development and come up with new products for this company that I own, or I'm proud owner in Midwest, Midwest Bioag, which is still a very viable business. And Gary's still very much a, a big spokesman in the industry of sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I went before the board of directors for an interview and it, it went really, really well until this one guy had a little clipboard <laughs> and he said, oh, do you have one guy. What do you know about humates? Never heard of them. <laughs> oh, <there you laughs> what go. do you know about rock phosphates? Nothing. Do you have a degree in agronomy? No. <laughs> and his checklist was start. I'm going, <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm they're just going to show me the door, you nope, know? Nope. Nope. And, nope. Uh, I don't even recall the rest of the questions, but it was all mm, mm, not me. I don't yeah. know anything about that. And it was, it was looking quite grim for a moment there in front of the board. And all of a sudden Gary jumps up and says, great, no bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. That's classic. <laughs> so my March, my marching orders in January of 2001, when I hired onto that company where you go out, you find out everything you possibly can about humates. You find out everything you possibly can about natural minerals, and we're looking for a rock phosphate in particular. Oh, you they were go. actually out there searching for some of these minerals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said, "You just go, you do that." And they never said, they never said, "Here's your budget, here's your limit." They handed me a credit card and said, "Use your own car. We'll cover your mileage. If yeah. you have to fly, we'll cover all your expenses." And that's what I did for the next two to three years as I immersed myself into humic substances and natural minerals because of that company. It was just an amazing experience. Basically using a background of organic chemistry, chemistry. Uh, and, and organic you know, and organic chemistry. Right, right. Because you've got to understand minerals on the inorganic side. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's fine. You, no, that's exactly what I was saying, is that you were basically going out there cold, like Gary was saying, but mm -hmm. using that organic, inorganic chemistry background and really coming into it with a very fresh um, perspective without a bias of, you know, this could yeah. be something I can sell, which is really wonderful if you really think about it from a... Name an herbicide besides Roundup, and I couldn't tell you anything <laughs> about it. Nothing. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. <laughs> So what did you learn and how did you go about doing that? How did you first find information? In 2000, humic acids were still, you know, very much snake oils. And uh, in, in certainly in our side of the industry, sustainable ag was getting a little bit more comfortable with the value of humic acids. But, you know, uh, you know as you know, um, our side of the industry being the turf world, it, it was still a snake oil. But you, you were able to go out and find. So where do you go? Who do you talk to? What, what's... What's the path that gets you down that road of becoming a humic asp? A, a, a First thing I did was I went down into the archives of the library, down in the stacks of the Steinberg Library at the University of Wisconsin campus. Go. And I found so much stuff on really? microbiology. I did. 
And what really blew me away was the state of Wisconsin said, essentially, if you say anything about biological activity in soils, you are going to go to jail, you're going to get fined, you know, you, you cannot <laughs> say anything about that. And I'm standing down there in the stacks of the University of Wisconsin Steenbach Library, named after their most famous soil scientist ever. And I'm reading a book written by Dr. Steenbach in 1912, talking about how ammonium sulfate increases biological activity. Wow. But you can't talk about this. I can't would they talk about this. That? Why would no. they even say that? And who says that? <clears throat> Industry drives yeah. everything. Yeah. Industry and, and big money in the state of Wisconsin drives everything. The state of Wisconsin still has a minimum N, P, and K rule on a, on a fertilizer oh, tag. Yes. If you don't have 24% highly soluble, and that's where everything went wrong right there, highly yeah. soluble. Yeah. If you don't have highly soluble N, P, and K, you are not a fertilizer in the state of Wisconsin. You have to provide three years of proof that it will work only in Wisconsin soils. And you got to do it through the University of Wisconsin with a professor signing off on the research. Yeah, we sell a 545 and it's not an Ooh. easy thing. So yeah, we know, we know that rule very well. We're talking so, a lot so, of money. <laughs> so what did you, how did you find, so explain to me again the path to humic acids. Where, where was the research on humic acid and how far back does that go? <clears throat> yeah, I didn't really have any trouble finding information on the problem I had was I couldn't believe what I was reading. I was oh, a really? trained, trained organic chemist, and I'd read a paragraph, and I'd reread the paragraph. <laughs> I didn't make a lot of progress on this. Right. And it's, they can't do that. You know, they can't do this and that at the same time and do this and that and this and this and this and this. So what I began to realize <laughs> over long lengths of time putting this all together is that these humic substances are synergistic with just about everything in a soil system, especially the biological activity because they're made by microbes, manufactured by microbes, and then used by microbes. Just like humans build houses and we live in them, same, same thing. You know, they build these things and then they utilize them. They don't eat them, they live in them, they, they interact with them, they get their water there. They, they, it's just a wonderful, the housing unit. mysterious material. Yeah. So, yeah. the, so the, how far back did the information go? I mean, how, how far back does humic acid uh, uh, story and data go when you were doing that research? I mean, it was looking like the glorious years for humic research, research in natural minerals, uh, plugging it all together and doing wonderful, beautiful, elegant experiments and publishing was about early 1980s. Oh, really? Okay. So that I saw this trend uh, in the books that I was pulling out of the library, bringing them home. If the book costs more than $50, I had to go, <laughs> I had to go to the university to read the book and, and photocopy yeah. it. This is before PDFs and all this. Yeah. Sort of What's thing. a photocopier? I don't yeah. know what they are. Yeah. They, they, you put a dime in the Xerox yeah, I remember that. at the That's... end of the hallway and you got one page. You know? Right. <laughs> so exactly. you put another Bag dime. Of dimes then you get smart and you buy a card. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I take all that stuff home, just volumes of photocopied stuff and volumes of volumes. Who was doing this work? Who, who, who was doing this work? Was it, was, it, uh, was it domestic? Was it international? It was, uh, it was driven primarily by about 60 chemists across the whole globe who all joined together in a society called the International Humic Substances Society. Wow, I never heard. They of were it. in That's... something so esoteric yeah. that they sometimes they didn't even understand what each other were saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I went to one of their meetings and oh my god, talk about woo -hoo, woo. <laughs> it didn't help when there was a guy standing. And you there. didn't understand him. If you're uh -huh. not going to understand him, you know the, the, the normal folk like us aren't going to get anywhere. Yeah, and then you mix in a foreign accent with that. It's like, right, exactly. <laughs> And I go, oh, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I stuck with it. And my marching orders from BioAg were, 
if you do not produce a product that's successful, at least has a lot of market potential within three years, you're out of here. I said, Hey, I'm used to that. You know, I would make 10 Fair. art items and only one of them would ever sell. So right. no issue here. <laughs> you know, I could live with that kind of risk. Fair. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, well, in 2003, we had some prototype products that were just doing things that were just incredible. Uh, one thing, one thing I got warned not to do by the uh, the scuttlebutt in the company was whatever you do, don't go over to Gary Zimmer's farm and try any of your products because nothing's ever worked. <laughs> <laughs> I did <laughs> went right over there. The first thing you did, right? Go one right. One of the first there. things. Exactly. Now, did not see an, a bump in in yield. Did not see a bump in quality parameters. Did not see a bump in protein, carbohydrates, anything. What really amazed me on Gary's farm is that they, they shipped everything out, the, the corn, they shipped their grain out in the fall to get dried down. They yeah. cut the dry down by 27%. Really? By, by and all corn. you did was add a corn. substance? By, what we did was we took what's called linardite, which is right. a geological deposit of these materials. And we blended them as a dry product and then put that product in the row with the seed because we knew that these are going to be rhizospheric interactions that we're trying to encourage. See, by that time, I was learning big words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever you say. <laughs> yeah. That's a heifer and that's a cow. There's that's a difference. That's good. Black and white and brown. Good. <laughs> What's that over there? <laughs> and uh, when they got that big dry down number, that actually paid and actually was a uh, reasonable return on investment, even on a farm that was notorious for having well-balanced, well-mineralized soils. So chemical, you, you, you had soil tests, obviously. The basic core chemistries were balanced. Uh, Calcium-magnesium ratios were in place. Uh, everything that we would talk about on balancing a soil was in place, but there was, uh, the, the thing that lacked was this carbon foundation. Is that a fair assessment? On Gary's farm? On Gary's farm. No. What no, was the he had, he, Carbon totally covered. Complex oh, okay. minerals totally covered. Uh, wonderful. The, we still don't have any parameters out there that we can hang our hat on and say, this is how you describe soil health. Right. Okay. No, that's true. It's still a we wide will. open area. There's, a, there's conferences on soil health, yeah. but they don't <laughs> even know what it is. They can't describe it. I mean, yeah. like, like humic substances. So on Gary's farm, he would do a, a farm day demonstration every year. I saw mm -hmm. it a gazillion times and I know it works. He would take some seed that was left over after planting season and he left a, a bare plot there because he knew he's going to demonstrate what that plot could do at field day in August, about mm -hmm. this time of the year. And what he would do at that field day, he would say, now this is my leftover seed. And there was everything and anything in there. It was whatever was left over that he just did, there, yeah. just that excess seed. And so you're standing here next to a crop that's either yay tall or, you know, it's, it's a big crop of something. It was usually right. corn and everything all mixed all together. And he would run a rotor, a rotivator through that. You know what that is? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Okay, he would run a Howard rotivator, rotivator through yes, the first His time. son would get on the tractor and just run a roll right down through there. And he would say, okay, this is how you incorporate green manure crops into the soil. And he said, in two weeks from now, uh, he says, there won't be anything here. And I would go over to that farm. It's two miles away. I would go over to that farm and there was nothing left on the surface of that soil. All, this, all, this, all uh, digested down. Gone. Yeah. Well, not gone, but you know what I mean. But gone. Yeah. Converted, I know what you mean. Yeah. Converted into Digesting. nutrients, bacteria, food, fungal yeah. food, everything was there. You know, look, you, you, you brought up this word, and I'm going to ask you to define this. You brought up the term Leonardite. Uh, yes. And we talk about this all the time, you and I and, and our team. Uh, we hear that phrase all the time. Um, explain to me the origins of the term and then give me a broad uh, definition, uh, if it's possible, of what Leonardite 
is. Yeah, you sent me some uh, things to look over. And yeah. on an SDS sheet on one of these products, it says humic acid, singular, comma, Leonardite. Leonardite, yeah. And that's common. That's common in a lot of commercial. Not the same. Not right. the same. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that. What define, you know, how did, where did the name come from? Define to us what Leonardite is because it's used so generically certainly in our industry and i think in a lot of agricultural industry um i and i you know and i think you'll you'll share this with us but i think it's overused or misused so uh, help me understand that a little bit better uh well technically the term leonardite is named it's a mineral it's named after dr leonard from the uh South Dakota, some university in North Dakota. Yeah. I might not have the right university but name. From that area. He was a professor and he was yep. a geologist and he found these materials that would uh, always be associated with layers of coal, mm -hmm. particularly lignite coal. Lignite is a very low grade, low value coal. It's, um, it's used in mostly power plants. And he called this material an oxidized or weathered material sitting on top of the coal deposits. <clears throat> uh, it was a worthless material because it had less than 4,500 BTU in them per pound. I believe the village thermal unit is based on the pound. And right. the, um, the value of this material was so low, they had no use for it. They used it as backfill to be compliant with their environmental agreements with the state to reclamate the land after they dug these gigantic holes in the ground. What year? So, were, what year is Dr. Leonard doing his initial research? I mean, sixty-seven, I believe. In the mid sixties. Okay. Yeah, sixties. Okay. <clears throat> so I didn't really tell you anything. I just told you this is some stuff they found one day, <laughs> and they named it after him. Okay. Now, as time went on. Uh, uh, you have to realize that up in North Dakota, these coal deposits are everywhere. Some of them are right at the surface. They found out that hogs would eat this Leonardite material, just chomp down on it, just loving it, just couldn't get enough. <laughs> and then they would stop and they'd go, that's when hogs were pasture raised. Right, you know, right. Mentioned. They weren't. So when they're out on the pasture, they would eat these things and then they were happy and then they went home. Now, Plugging that into the fact that Gary Zimmer found out that down in Australia, they would feed this Leonardite type material to their young newborn calves and they would chomp on it. They would eat it for anywhere from 10 days to three weeks and then just stop. That was it. Never went back to it. Free really? choice. Free cho yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Gary's theory was that he thinks they're detoxifying after they are born, you know, after they go through the birthing and stress process. That's amazing. And uh, he fed it to them. He free choiced them and they, he, they'd, buy, they'd dive into it and they would just come out with black faces right. all over. <laughs> it is a black material, very dusty material. So I don't think this is helping you describe humic acids, which is where we really should go. Well, I'm trying to kind of understand the term Leonardite because like I said, it's uh, so heavily overused and it's used so generically. And, 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 and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it's misused. Uh, you know, I, I remember I had a conversation with a client the other day who said, oh, well, you know, I talked to my, my vendor. He says, no, the best humic acid is just Leonardite. And, and you well, know, my understanding <laughs> of that is that okay. said nothing. Let's expand. Right? Let yeah, me exactly. expand on the word Please. Leonardite. If I own a mine in North Dakota and I'm mining Leonardite into the market, that is a marketing term. If I own a mine down in the southwestern United States, let's say in Arizona, and I'm mining almost the identical material, same geological origin, blah, 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 blah. We don't call it Leonardite down there because we got to be totally different from that stuff up in North right. Dakota because ours is better. Right. So we're gonna call it, we're gonna call ours oxidized lignite. Gotcha. Now up in Canada, they got a big problem. They're they they're not in North Dakota. They're not in the Southwest United States. So what are we going to call ours? We got to be totally different than those down the lower 48. Let's call it humulite. <laughs> but it's all technically the same mineral. It's all technically coming from this coal deposit. Oh gosh, yes. He reaches for a book. <laughs> Try this. 
Ah, look at that. Lignites of North America, the book. How big yeah. is that? That's what, a thousand pages? Yeah, that's a big book. <laughs> I got this one marked right I here. I see that. Yeah, I got a couple, <laughs> couple uh, tags on that thing. Uh, so when somebody in our industry said- $500 book. <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. That's worth anyway, it. Anyway, uh, this is an extensive review and analysis of the lignites. And what they found out was that the lignites- in the southwest that would i should say the oxidized portion or the weathered portion of these lignites only vary in their amount of carbohydrates when they're oh, totally okay. an analyzed that's the only difference right right and in my experience i've had real good results with all three <laughs> and there's they all work very effectively so they, when somebody great. is saying we use uh leonardite are they saying anything in particular? Is there really, you had just mentioned the label that, that we had shared with you that says humic acids derived from leonardite. Does, is, that, is that a true statement? I mean, does that mean anything? Um, in order to have a legally compliant label, you need to state on that label where your humic acids were derived from. So gotcha. they are a derivative product. Right. So they're derived from leonardite, they're derived from oxidized lignite, they could be derived from uh, certain clays, or they're derived from humic shale. So this is all spelled well. out. This is all spelled out by regulators. So, so you I, have I, to have a derived from statement on your label to have a legal label. I think I shared with you this story a few times, uh, but when Jerry and I first started Earthworks back in the uh, early 90s, uh, I remember this definitively. We went to a local association, you know, tech meeting, lots of speakers. And one of the local, uh, one of the professors from, I believe it was Cornell, uh, who shall remain nameless, but he got up in front of the group uh, and wanted to do, basically debunk the whole idea. He goes, well, I don't know what this Leon Dite stuff is, but one yeah. of my geologist friends said it was coal dust, and I don't know what coal dust is going to do for turf plants. And that was the statement being passed around in academia in the early 90s. And mm -hmm. for the next 10 years, uh, Jerry and I, as we built out a uh, uh, every product that we have with a humic acid substance um, that has obviously changed since uh, you've been working closely with us. Uh, but ever since then, you know, humic now, acids have been part of what just, we've been doing. You just used the word humic acids. We hadn't even <laughs> talked about that yet. <laughs> no, I understand that. But, okay. but the point being is, is that humic substances, however we've defined that, and we'll, I'll let you do that here in a second. But it's been, it's been you know, we've been blasted as snake oils for 20 years of our 30 years experience. And now you're seeing every, every single manufacturer uh, in our side of the world and probably in, in the sustainable ag side uh, using some level of what they're calling Leonardite humic acids. But, but talk to us about humic acids. So we take these, these lignous materials and we now create a liquid extraction, which is now changing the whole dynamic once again, correct? Define coffee. <laughs> Something that keeps me up <laughs> in the morning so I can speak. Good start. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. That's all, that's all I care about. What does it do for me? You, you right. told me that a lot of your folks cannot define what humic acids are. Right. Can you define coffee? No, that's a good point. And that's exactly what we're it's trying to It's not a lot different because what the problem with the term humic acids that makes everybody wonder whether it's a legitimate term or not, is because it is operationally defined. Gotcha. Your coffee that you're drinking right now is an extract. It's a hot water extract. Right. Okay. It's it's not the bean. Right it's now. not it the doesn't... plant. Yeah. It doesn't. It, what is it exactly? Well, it's an extremely complex chemical mixture of things. If we stuck that into like a high performance, what's, what's that thing called here? I just ran across it today. Because I think this might help me in the future. High resolution gas chromatography mass spectroscopy. I think maybe we can yeah, figure that. out what's in your coffee. <laughs> okay. gotcha. we can break it's it a all complex down. mixture. It's an extract. It's not a natural substance once you treat it with anything, hot water, acid, alkali, 
it's no longer what it used to be because you operationally define what's in your cup of coffee. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And that's, okay, a cup of coffee is a hot water liquid extract of whatever was ground up in out of a bean. And the bean is treated and you know it's roasted. It comes from mountains or it comes from some lead mining pit somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. It's up. Your coffee is operationally defined. Right. It tells you nothing about it chemically. Absolutely nothing. Your coffee was derived from what? Well, you could look at the generic term for coffee, which is acacia, blah, blah, something or other in Latin. Right. Okay. <laughs> so we don't understand. <laughs> if you took something that looked like black coal powder, that professor wasn't too far off the mark. Oh, I, I don't argue that. Yeah, it is. It's black. It's nasty. It's dirty. It's really, really hard to handle. And you treat it with uh, lye, sodium hydroxide. Lye is very capable of extracting amino acids, proteins. It'll dissolve organic matter. So the lye will extract whatever organic matter is in this leonardite coal dust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what's left over is an alkali extract of that. Okay, that's step one. We haven't gotten to humic acids yet. Right. That's just an alkali extract. Now, somebody somewhere around 1700s, somewhere in there, found out that if he did the same thing with peat and then acidified it to a pH of one or two range, very acid, with hydrochloric acid, this stuff would fall out of solution. And they go, oh, what's that? <laughs> then they named it. They named it humic acid. Oh, so it goes back that far, the terminologies. Yes. Oh, yeah. The history of these, of the Where research. Where did the word come from? Any idea? The word humic acid? Uh, it comes from the Latin, just much, much like the word human is derived right. from the word Latin. And it, it means earth in Latin, something that's derived from the earth. So humus is derived from the earth and humic acids, there's a close connection there in the etymology of the words. So, so let's talk about these now acidified um, leonardites, lignites. Uh, Alkali I mean, extracted then is There you go, okay. Operationally defined. <laughs> so we're, you know, all oh, of us. Oh, oh, analogy, analogy, analogy. Please. You do a hot water extract of your coffee bean that's ground up, and then you, now you have an extraction, but then you add what? Cream or sugar or there, both? There, yeah. In, in every case, that I, in every step that I just outlined there, that's operationally defining what you're drinking. It's not changing, telling you changing anything else. Definition, yeah. It's an extract that has some cream in it. Okay. Right. Humic acids are an extract that have been acidified. So, so let's stay on this track for a little bit here. So we've now acidified a humic acid. We've got a liquid material. Um, there has to be pretty massive differences between the processes. I mean, everybody seems to have a different story. Uh, everybody seems to have a different percentage. I think I shared with you a couple that, you know, call themselves 85% humic acids uh, in their liquids. And, and this is where much of the confusion comes in all of agriculture, not just, you know, on the uh, turf and ornamental side. But um, I think a lot of folks that would be listening to us or that we work with are, are really confused as to, okay, first of all, what is it? And, and we can talk a little bit down the road here as to what they do, but let's, let's stay with what the chemistry is. And, and there he goes off to the files to pick up even more definitions. But, you know, we, we, get, um, we get all sorts of people coming in saying, oh, we're just like them. And we've got 85% humic acid or ours are better. And we've got fulvic and humic and we've got this and we've got that. And, and it's, um, it is very confusing. And it's, you know, I, I'll go to a classroom and I'll, I'll say, how many people, uh, there you go. So Lawrence, <laughs> well, and we're going to do this properly on a, uh, another video, but Lawrence is holding up a chemical composition of what could be a humic acid. And I can't, I don't understand it, even with organic chemistry. Uh, I think I got to be in organic chemistry, but it's, it's very complex. So 
how Stick do you do that in a bottle? Stick that in a bottle. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Can you, can you imagine the molecular weight of a material like that? No. I mean, you think lead is heavy. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the molecular weight of this material must be in the thousands. Yes. Lead is 230 something, yeah. Okay, so how much of this incredibly complex, perhaps a molecule, we don't know. Right can you jam into a gallon of water and stick it in a bottle? You know what the answer is? In the range of about six to 12% of the total weight of the water that's in that bottle. That's what you can do. So six to 12% is what you're saying is a maximum that you're gonna ever really be able to label. Yeah, beyond that, how are you gonna do it? <laughs> how would you do that? So yeah. when it's you see- physically, It'd be physically impossible to exceed those limits by, a substantial margin. Maybe you'll hit 15, 14%. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you that. But beyond that, you're pushing the limits of the liquid to actually hold such a complex structure. So, I mean, given anybody in our industries um, the benefit of the doubt, when they suggest that they've got 85% humic acid, um, assuming they're not, they're not complete criminals, and, and I'm going to assume that they're not, what would they potentially actually be trying to say there? What could possibly be their message if they say our product has 85% humic acid? Humic acids, um, let me back up a second. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Let's go back to linardite. Okay. If we did a proximate analysis of linardite, there, you'd find a lot of iron in it. Maybe yeah. two, three, four percent of it is iron. Uh, you're going to find a lot of silicon, tons of silicon. Mm -hmm. Well, I shouldn't use the word tons. A relatively high percentage of silicon, because it's everywhere. It's three fourths of what a soil yeah. is made it's up the of. the element. So, so it, yeah, it's bound to be there. Yeah. Aluminum to some degree. Uh, name any metallic element or alkaline element. Sodium, uh, potassium, calcium. These are all uh, in natural association with the linardite when it's sitting in the ground. And then they mine it, and they take it out of the ground, they usually just crush it and screen it. And then you take it somewhere and you process it. And you're, oh yeah, to get back to one of your points about everybody claims to be doing something a little different on the extraction site. Uh, just about everybody does potassium hydroxide because yeah, it's very, very efficient. Yeah. It's extremely efficient. Right. Nobody wants to use sodium hydroxide. It's just, who wants yeah, that sodium? sodium. Yeah, yeah, who wants that? And so potassium, hey, we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> potassium hydroxide is almost universally used to extract these materials. And it's allowed under the organic standards also. So you, you'll be hard pressed to find someone extracting their lenardite or their oxidized lignite or their humolite or whatever else you want to call it. In Germany, they have a different name for it. Then this, this solution that's left over that's been extracted has to have all these other accompanying minerals in it because you did nothing to avoid them. You just did a, you just did a lye extraction, so they're there. They're there. Then you, you pack up a sample of that. And you send it to um, a &L Labs, Western Labs, let's say in Modesta, California, and you say, I want you to run the California Department of Food and Agriculture method, the CDFA method. Yeah, you'll get 70%, right. you'll get 80%. Right. Yeah, you, this is out. gonna look really, really good because they weighed the iron along with the humic acids on their little balance and they said, wow, okay, this so, is a great product. <laughs> so they're pulling in everything. So that makes perfect sense. Talk mm, to me. It's a flaw, me. it's a basically a these flawed people, test. The, the people putting that on their tag may not be <laughs> uh, dishonest. Let's they assume they're not. They I, may not be aware yeah. that they just got a flawed analytical method right. to make that claim. So, And we're going to talk a little bit about the HPTA here in a minute, but I want you to okay. help me understand and help uh, everybody listening to understand. Um, give us the nickel tour of why a uh, humic acid, what do they do for us in the soil? You kind of already broached this in a couple of your mm -hmm. stories, but let's just really dive deeper into 
what is the value of a humic acid? What is a humic acid do for us? And what doesn't it do? There's a lot of claims right now being, uh, being thrown around about humic acids that are grandiose, uh, changing the world. And uh, you've already kind of broached on some of this, but go back into now, why would I want to put a humic acid onto my soil? In um, 2008, 2009, 2010, right in that range, fertilizers in for ag, agricultural purposes, soared. There was a bit of a shortage. I don't know. I don't remember what caused it exactly, but uh, people were used to paying 150 to $200 a ton for a uh, material. Yeah. Started looking at $800,000 a ton. And they had heard, the, the, of, the farmers and growers had heard just word of mouth that humic materials will actually make your fertilizer dollar go longer, better. You can stretch your fertilizer investment because they increase the efficiency and utilization of fertilizers. And guess what happened every year after that? The industry grew and grew and grew in double digits every year. Once these farmers discovered that, hey, these things do what what I've heard they do. So what they do is they do make fertilizers very efficient, especially micronutrients. And you can put that claim on your label, by the way, about micronutrients. You can put a label claim on there that increases the, the availability or bioavailability of phosphates. So the mechanisms aren't well understood, but the markets understand that there's value in these things. And after fertilizers really went up, in cost than, than these materials really, really did well. Um, I think it's because they provide the conditions for microbiological activity to proceed in a more normal manner rather than being inundated by high inputs of NP and K and everything else, even calcium can be overdone. And yeah. I think that they, in a balanced system, actually provide the conditions for these efficiencies that we see and these, these wonderful results that we see. Now, if the plant is healthy because of its nutrition is balanced, just like humans' nutrition, then they're healthy. You, you can cut back on pesticides, herbicides, because these plants are healthier. The problem we have in this modern world is that everybody's addicted to chemicals. You know, I don't think you can talk them out of it. They're going to continue to use them. And that's and they don't have to. They don't have to to a very very large degree if they know how to balance the soil system. And these things help balance that system. They do buffer pH. They're they're strong buffering materials. No doubt about that. But then there's this phenomenon called biological buffering. Larry Phelan at the Ohio State University came up with this theory. And I met with him and I said, well, I see in your research you use zinc and you use this and that and this. What can you use in your, in your model to demonstrate there's biological buffering? And his answer was any plant nutrient. Ooh. Right. Oh. <laughs> so you got a book right there in your shelf. I can see it on my screen. The Art of Soil. Yes, Bill McKibben. We interviewed him last week. Uh, actually, Balance. it just hit the, to, today's Tuesday. We hit our podcast uh, system today, and Bill's been our agronomist at Logan for years. But yeah, I mean, okay. that term of So balance. if you want to pour on huge amounts of soluble nitrogen and huge yeah. amounts of soluble potassium, guess what? I wouldn't expect too much out of these materials. You, uh, what most people don't realize is that there's very, very little soluble nutrients in a soil system to begin with. That's right. not a natural thing. They're always associated with organic matter, except potassium, but they're, they're always associated. We'll talk with about that another day. What's that? We'll talk about your potassium theories another day. And I, I'm theory? By, well, you're, 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 how you've taught us on potassium, but let's keep on, on the track of humic acid for now. More is, more is less and less yeah, is more. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so humic acids, and you said this earlier, humic acids are, uh, and I think I stole this from you because I, I tend to steal either from you or from Jerry. Um, um, I, I stole the term, uh, it's kind of like a coral reef. 
for the soil. It's not feeding the, the plant. It's not providing carbon for the plant. Microbes aren't using the humic acid substances as a food source, but they are finding um, a place to house, if you will, hold moisture, uh, build some CEC, bring in nutrients. I mean, all of these things are part of the benefits. And the other benefit that I'd like you to discuss, and that's certainly very pertinent to the work you do with us, is that in our formulas, we're using that humic acid complex that we've uh, that you've helped us build uh, to work as a chelating agent within the formula itself. I mean, uh, and you know, you when you first started really working with us was just uh, when I really got close with you on our products was just after Jerry had passed, and I'd asked you to review some of the stuff, and we were having some troubles at that time, honestly, with keeping everything in suspension. The work you have done uh, with the humic acid complex has improved our quality control exponentially because you have worked so diligently to bring the right combinations of these materials into our complex to keep everything in suspension. So that's another huge benefit that we're, uh, we're enjoying uh, of this. So it, it sounds like there's an awful lot of things that these materials can, can intertwine themselves through uh, any agricultural process. And I just bounced you around five different steps, but, uh, but all of those things have been very important to, to us and, and obviously to our clients. Yeah, that's what I discovered down in the stacks at the Steenbach Library. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I uh, bet. Like, whoa. You know, There's a lot of stuff in here. I, uh, it was just unbelievable what I was reading, but I was reading the scientific literature, which I think is the truth on yeah. balance. And uh, if you're seeking the truth about these materials, you, uh, you have no choice but to dive into the scientific literature. Your analogy of the coral reef is excellent. Good. Uh, you see there's so many, there's a complex ecosystem going on in a coral reef, which is beyond description. It, it requires research of one thing that leads to another that leads to another. So there's no end to trying to figure out how these coral reef systems right. actually interact with living systems in the ocean. And yeah. if you frighten all those fish flying, you know, swimming around right. real happy, if you frighten them, where do they go? right into the coral reef, the coral they hide. Reef. They're very, very, their reaction is very much like a microbe would do yeah. if it was insulted by high salt fertilizers or something, it'll kill them. So they gotta go hide somewhere. So it's buffering, that term buffering is buffering that soil complex. That's that but biological buffering. Effect. You, you use this word truth. So let me go down that road a little bit with you, Lawrence. Um, yeah. Talk to me about uh, an awful lot of the products that we see in our industry, and I would say this is probably true across the board, that claim to be humic acids. And then we'll, I'll, I'm gonna ask you the question on lignosulfonates. Explain to me what a lignosulfonate is, and then I'm gonna bounce you right into, again, the truth, uh, how you got started with the HPTA, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But explain to me what a lignosulfonate is. Um, a lot of people are using them and claiming them to be humic mm -hmm. acids, and you have shared with us many times they are not even close. Well, the funny thing is <laughs> humic <laughs> substances are derived from lignin. Lignin is the plant material that breaks down pretty well last. In a, in, a, in a series of microbiological breakdown. And the lignin is highly stable, but that's the backbone of humic substances. Right. It, you, can, you can actually find remnants of lignin molecules if you study the, the molecular structure of humic substances. Uh, the process of making lignosulfonate is first of all, starting out with a very high lignin material which is a paper industry process, by the way. Right. And uh, they essentially want to move some of that lignin out of this paper and end up with a chemical structure that they can stamp out and bleach out and so forth. The leftover liquor, the black liquor that's left over is the result of being treated with sulfides, I-D-E-S, sulfides. Mm -hmm. And the sulfide actually interact with the lignin and produce and then they're oxidized, a sulfate, a very complex sulfate. And it complexes with the lignin 
and it is a distinct molecule. The structure of lignosulfonate is well known, it's very well characterized, melting point, boiling point, molecular structure, da 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 all these sort of things are well characterized for lignosulfonate. Not true for humic substances. There is no known structure for humic gotcha. acid, even though I flashed it up on the right. screen. Oh, that's, that's somebody's proposed structure. Right. But they never get any traction in the scientific world. Once you propose a structure, you might as well just move on to your next project because right, right. you're not going to hear much about your proposed structure because they're far more complex than lignosulfonate. And a lignosulfonate is not a humic acid. By lignosulfonate has the definition. ability to chelate. Ah, okay. And there's, there's, there's okay, the now we're getting into something there that humic go. substances do. Right. right. So they can chelate. But I tell you what they can't do. They can't do all those phenomenal things that I read down in the Steenbach Library on those winter days going, right. oh my God, these things do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. Okay, so lignosulfonate- Can they structurally the work the same way? Will they work structurally in the soil much as the coral reef? Will they work that way? So they're not, they're, they're structurally not close. So from a biological soil management standpoint, they're not providing the same kind of- First of uh, all, buffer first reservoir. Of all, the big difference between a lignosulfonate, which can have some performance characteristics. So right. I just, the big difference between a lignosulfonate and a humic material is their solubility. They're gotcha. highly soluble in water, whereas humic substances are not, not highly all. soluble in water. Not at all. <laughs> no. Uh -uh. As we I just know, said, I just said fact. a while ago, you got to extract yeah. them with lye. That is not the definition of a highly soluble substance. You know, like your skin, you, your skin can be dissolved by lye. Right. So very, very similar. So as, as we the same. Out of as we run out of time here, Lawrence, let's talk about uh, the Humic Products Trade Association. You were yeah. instrumental in getting that started. Uh, you, uh, as you know, you began working with us. You actually came to us uh, after the passing of Jerry and, and said, some of these materials you're calling humates aren't. Uh, we changed them at your direction and we qualified uh, to be a member of the HPTA, and we're very proud of that, and we wear that on our sleeve because uh, we do want to make sure that uh, the snake oil uh, 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 mantra of, of these materials is no longer. So talk to me about how you guys got started with the HPTA, the Humic Products Trade Association, what the goal was, and, 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 um, you know, and, and what the qualifications are now. And I, I'm, I think it's just okay. A so Gary Zimmer hired me in 2000. He said, you go right. out and find out everything you can about humic substances. We did. We, we came up with wonderful products, very effective products, affordable you know, everything, all the, everything was there for scaling up and marketing and everything else, except for one thing. They were illegal in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> Other than that, snake Other than oil. That, we don't have any <laughs> issues with them. Other than that, you can't use them or sell them, but other than that. And, and Minnesota too. was, I'll, okay, I'll refrain from using yeah, Let's be careful words. here. Let's be careful. Minnesota was worse. Forum. North Dakota didn't mind the products at all. South Dakota said, you can't even put the three letters H-U-M in a product label. <laughs> There's no such thing as humic substances. Oh, my goodness. So that was the year 03, 04, somewhere right. in there. Then uh, <laughs> BioAg sent me down to the uh, APCO meeting. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Association of American Plant Food Control Officials, the good old boy network that that runs our fertilizer system right. in the United States of America, preserving, free, absolutely doing everything you can to preserve the status quo. Of, of Chesapeake Bay, yeah. what's that? Exactly. <laughs> Gulf, the Gulf? No, no, it has yeah. nothing to do with us. Don't worry about that. They sent me down there to get an official term for the word organic. <laughs> really? Yeah. Before 2004, Anything organic under fertilizer regulator rules was carbon-based. Carbon. Urea, that's organic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You see the picture. You so like Wisconsin was beating us over the head with this hammer saying, nah, nah, you can't do that. We did an end run around Wisconsin, got APCO to approve the word organic, which became a, which is a federal law. Right. 
and the state of Wisconsin said, okay, all right, all right, all right. You can use yeah, uncle <laughs> blankety blank things right. because yeah. they're legal under the, the National Organic Program. Right. And that's how we put them on our tag. We made sure that any product we developed was organically compliant. And then the state of Wisconsin said, oh, by the way, you can only sell them to organically certified farms. Oh, not in transition, not right. mom and pop gardeners, only organically certified. Oh, oh boy. You got to be kidding. So, well, it, yeah. once, so once the public found out about that, you can imagine what happened. They, oh, they just said, okay, you know, it, you know grassroots. You know, here, go ahead and use them. So, uh, there was huge regulatory issues across the whole United States of America about these problems. But once the organic uh, regulations went into place. Now we had a mechanism to use them to get them out there. And I'm sure they ended up on non-organic farms. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that really went pretty well. But in 2010, uh, everybody was pretty well fed up with the lack of regulations on these materials. And like you said, I, my wife and I are the founder, founders of the Humic Products Trade Association. It grew out of this problem with regulations. Okay. So once they became legal under the organic standards, there was not any way of analyzing them. So regulators still stood firm and said, no, if you don't have a standardized analysis, you cannot sell these materials. You cannot make any tag guarantees. Gotcha. 10 years later, <laughs> that's, yeah, in 2018, two years, past uh -huh. um, the humic products trade association managed to get the iso 19822 standard approved internationally so that takes care of everybody and that so international like standard is a international standard on the analytical method the only standardized analytical method out there that's been validated for humic acids and now hold on to your hat <laughs> hydrophobic fulvic acids, because fulvic acids consist of an alkaline form, a neutral form, and an acid pH form, because they're soluble in both, right? right? So how do you define them? Boy, does it get complicated after that. The definition, which is again, operationally defined, really defines the hydrophobic fulvic acids as something that will cling to a DAX8 resin. It's operationally defined you elute the material that sticks to that resin and falls into a, a beaker and you, and you do your, your weighing, your gravimetric right. portion, and you come up with a number. The industry hated it because all these years they've been saying they had 36% fulvic acid. <laughs> they, you know, right. They're Oops. lucky if they even had One zero. Two, Most yeah, of them came exactly. back zip. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it hasn't been that popular, but at least we do have a standardized method for what the active ingredient is in a fulvic acid. These are the active ingredients, by the way. It's good scientific research on the right. hydrophobic portion of these materials are very, very good at root development, by the way. And, so and so HPTA established a center. So those of us that are HPTA members mm -hmm. have to get our products qualified through the HPTA standards. Um, and, and I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong again, but uh, you also, you also have to sign an agreement, right? Right. Exactly. You remember that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> but, but, you know, the reason we were interested is because, you know, having worked with you, obviously we knew our products were, had already fallen under the standards and we just wanted to make sure that um, from a, uh, customer protection standpoint, everybody understood that uh, what we are using and selling is in fact a humic acid, whereas much of what we see in the market are, are these lignosulfonates and, and um, claims that are just not even close. I mean, it's amazing to me, uh, companies that uh, used to call us every name in the book uh, now actually add humic acids to the products, although we, we <laughs> think they're probably not really humic acids. But the HPTA has changed all that. Um, I hate to say this because I can talk to you for hours on end, but we're uh, we're pushing up against the clock. I will share with everybody that we are going to produce a uh, a larger, more in detail conversation with Lawrence, where he'll actually bring in PowerPoint slides, and I think we're going to have Jack Higgins and I 
uh, kind of play your audience and, and we'll put that on our website because this is such a, a, a big conversation and a powerful conversation and one that is very esoteric, very hard to understand. But Lawrence, I can't thank you enough for all you do for us. I can't thank you enough for the time you just gave us. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue this conversation with you if you're uh, open to that on both our podcast and on other uh, uh, other forms on our website. But um, uh, we have run out of time. I, I, I just I, I look at the clock and it's just amazing to me. I, I recall the days of working with Jerry, and you worked with Jerry quite quite often as well. But I could spend literally three four hours talking with you and or with Jerry and realize three, four hours just went by like that. And it's, uh, and it's all good. It's all valuable. Um, I thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, we'll have you back again as a guest because there's a lot that we can talk about. And I'm going to say goodbye for the Earthworks podcast. Uh, we'll be back again next week. Thank you very much. Thanks.